Thank you. Bless you. I just want to spend uh, a bit of time with you this morning exploring Isaiah 58. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Um, I was drawn to this, uh, and if you're familiar with Isaiah 58, you probably know that the title that's been put above this chapter is True Fasting. And, and it was actually fasting that, that led me to this verse. And um, yeah, we were in a season at Compassion where uh, a team of us, I, I'm part of a team that, that, that prays regularly for the ministry of compassion. We're, we're, we're called a prayer shield, so we pray over the ministry. And we felt led to uh, advise the uh, executive team, our leadership, that, that we felt God was calling us to fast. And so in January, we went through a month of prayer and fasting, and we, we did some teaching alongside that. And as part of that teaching, as often is the way when you're teaching about fasting, you, you end up in Isaiah 58. Uh, but actually, I don't really want to talk about fasting, because as I've meditated, and you'll probably be really pleased to know about that, um, as I spent time meditating on this, this chapter, I realised that it was actually not just about fasting, it's about much more than fasting. And so I just want to take some time exploring some of that with you this morning. Now, as I say, I'm not going to read the entire chapter so just to summarise, this is, Isaiah 58 was written by the prophet Isaiah to the people of God at a time that they were living in exile in Babylon. So they had been, they had been defeated, the Babylonians had attacked Jerusalem, they defeated them, they destroyed the city, they burnt the temple to the ground and they captured the people of God and they'd taken them back to Babylon and they were living in exile. And it's in this context that God sent this message to the, the prophet Isaiah, and it, it's, a, it's a very stern message. He starts out by saying, shout it out, don't hold back. And he's saying to the people, you seem eager to fast, you seem eager, eager to do all these religious things. And, and then you're asking me, God, why aren't you answering our prayers? And God is saying to his people, I'm not answering your prayers because when you fast, on the same day that you fast, you're exploiting your workers. On the same day that you fast, you're ending up in quarrelling and strife and fighting with other people. And you're fasting for one day, and trying to be holy and righteous for one day isn't going to cover up all the stuff that's going on the rest of the week. And so God then says this in verse 6, if we could get it up on the screen. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see naked, the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and the Lord will say, here am I. So God is talking to his people and he's saying that to them, actually you're doing these things, you're doing these religious things, these spiritual things, but really your heart's not in it. Where are our hearts today, church? You know, sometimes we do things that we think we ought to do or should do because we're Christians and that's, that's the kind of things that Christians do. But actually, if our hearts are not in it, we're not really aligned to where God wants us to be. And what God is trying to convey to his people in this message is actually there's a, there's a discrepancy between where our hearts can be and where his heart is. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 says, A man looks at the outside of a person, but the Lord looks at the heart. If we could jump on a couple of slides, please. The purpose of fasting, the purpose of any spiritual discipline, 
is actually for us to get closer to God. It's to draw us near to him. And as we draw near to God, he begins to change us. He begins to transform us. As we've heard from Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we dwell on God, as we walk towards him and work towards him, as we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as we seek to transform the world around us, we ourselves are transformed. God wants to give us a heart transplant. That's the purpose of all of these spiritual things. All of these religious practices is to draw us closer to him so we can get closer to his heart and we can have the same heart that he has that he has. In Ezekiel 35, it says, a new heart will I give you. And God in these verses is revealing what is on his heart. He's revealing what is on his heart, that he is a God of justice. I've just been praying over these last couple of weeks with the psalmist, saying, God, give me an undivided heart. Break my heart, Lord, for what breaks yours. Justice is the administration of what is right. If you've ever been to a, uh, a court, you've probably seen a statue outside, and that statue is of Lady Justice. It's an old kind of Roman, Greek, um, uh, mythical character. And on, uh, Lady Justice always has two things, has a set of scales in one hand. That's about weighing up, it's about balance, it's about a fair trial. And, it ha- and she has a sword in the other hand. And that's about the justice, about administering. So justice is about two things. It's about establishing what is right, but then also administering what is right. And what God is saying to his people is actually you can try and do the right things, but actually if you're not living it out, you're not really getting it. You're not really getting the point of where my heart is at. Justice is the administration of what is right. God calls, I mean, we live in a culture, don't we, that debates endlessly about what is right and wrong. It's very easy for us to get on social media or whatever platform we use and point out people that are doing things that we think is not right. That's the easy part sometimes, establishing what is right, but actually being the administrators of what is right. It's where it becomes difficult. And that's where God's heart is. James 2.20 says, faith without works is dead. So just as God doesn't want us to do religious things for the sake of it because we ought to when our heart isn't in it, he also doesn't want us to be theologically sound people that actually stand by and let injustice go on before us. God is a God of action. I grew up in a church that was very fixated on, on orthodoxy, right belief, but less interested in orthopraxy, right practice, actually doing from your belief. My pastor says to me, belief is looking at a chair and thinking, yes, that will take my weight if I sit on it, but faith is actually going and sitting on it. That's the difference. God is talking to us about what is on our hearts. Because, as it says in Matthew 15, the things that come off, out of a person's mouth come from the heart. When we are right with God in our hearts, when our hearts break for what breaks his, that affects the way that we think. It's that transformation and that renewing of our mind. And then that affects the words that we speak and the actions that we take. God is calling his people to be a people of integrity. That's what he's looking for. God doesn't want people doing religious things for the sake of it. Because what that becomes then is a transaction. God, I I do this, this and this, and then you need to do that, that and that. God is looking for relationship. God is looking for relationship. Martin Luther King on the day before he died, he gave what was probably his second most famous speech, known as the mountaintop speech. Um, it was actually a sermon, 
uh, and bits of it you'll often see clips quoted, uh, but it was actually a sermon and he centered it around the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and he said this, the first question the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Are there some questions that we need to reverse? I was on my way to speak at another black country church two weeks ago. And when I head over this way, I live in Sutton Coldfield. Uh, I often go via the Scott Arms. Anybody know the Scott Arms Junction? Anyone travelled around there? If you've ever travelled around there, you sit, the, it's four way dual carriageway traffic lights, so you often sit there for a very, very long time. And one of the joys of travelling on a Sunday morning is there isn't that much traffic, so you, you, you often don't have to wait too long. But because there's often a wait, uh, what you find is there's often uh, people waiting at the traffic lights asking for money. And so two weeks ago, Sunday, I, was, I pulled up and I was about the third or fourth car back, and there was a guy that, that started walking up with a, a little cup for people to put money in, and he had a sign that said homeless and hungry. And there am I about to go and preach a message about having a heart for justice, and I'm trying to avoid eye contact with this guy walking towards me. And the question that was on my heart was, why is this guy walking towards me? And as I pondered and reflected on that, I realised that actually I'm asking the wrong question. The right question for me is, why is it not me spending my Sunday mornings walking up and down lines of traffic, asking people for money? And the only answer to that question is the grace of God. The only reason it's not me on the other side of that window and it's not somebody else sat in my nice, warm, comfortable car is the grace of God there, but by the grace of God go I. I wonder if there are some questions that we need to reverse that we've had got rolling around in our mind. And so when we align ourselves with God, when we really seek his heart, when we search after him, and he begins to impact us. He begins to change our thinking. And that begins to manifest it in the way that we live our lives. God is very clear to us in scripture. And these verses are no different about what he will do. He says he will bless us. We can get, we can get a, a little bit nervous about talking about God's blessings sometimes. If we do this, God will bless us. Because we, we, we're a bit nervous about preaching some kind of prosperity gospel prosperity mindset but all throughout scripture God says again and again and again when you do this I will bless you and that's what he says here in verse 8 then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard and he goes on to to talk about inheritance in verse 14 he talks about in verse 12 the restoration of Jerusalem. These were people who, who were living in captivity. Their city had been destroyed and he was speaking to them about them going home and their city and their temple being restored and rebuilt. This was the thing that they longed for most. And God is saying, I'm going to give it to you. What do you long for most? God says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the secret desires of your heart. I don't know if any of you have ever had a secret desire fulfilled by God. I, I, I remember, as I was thinking about this, when I was 11 or 12, I, I went round to a friend's house, and this friend had an older brother, and we went into his, this, this brother's bedroom, and every single surface in the room was covered in trophies. He was into motocross or some sport like that. And he was obviously very successful because literally there must have been 50 or 60 trophies all over the room. And as I looked around this room, I was amazed. But I was also a little bit sad because I thought to myself, do you know what? I don't think I've ever won a trophy for anything. And I just had this slight hint of sadness. 
and really the rest of my childhood, I'd probably count the number of trophies I won on one finger. And it was, it was a moment, I don't want to overstate it, because actually I pretty much forgot about it, but I had this moment of, of sadness that wouldn't it be great if, if I won some trophies? I don't want all, all, of, all of these, but I'd like to win maybe just one or two. But I didn't lose any sleep over it. It was just something I never told anyone about it. It wasn't a big deal. But about 25 years later, I walked into my son's bedroom one day, and I stopped and I looked around and realized that every single surface in his bedroom was covered in trophies. And as I stopped in my tracks, I suddenly remembered that moment from all those years ago and I felt God say to me, I've been waiting for 25 years to show you this moment. That moment that you were sad, that moment that you, were, you felt a little bit down, that you'd never won a trophy. I've been waiting to show you this. My son's uh, been blessed, or been part of a few, a few different sports, a few quite successful teams, and he's won some individual awards. And these trophies mean a lot more to me than they do to him, because he's, he's won so many. But you know something, when God blesses you through your children, it's even better than when he blesses you directly yourself. God wants to bless us. And God's blessings are not something that are confined to the Old Testament 2 Corinthians, Graham's already referred to this this morning, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each, each of you should give what you decide in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God wants to bless his children. He is the kindest, most generous person that you could ever imagine. He wants to be good to his children. But he's calling us to share his heart. But you know, it's difficult, isn't it? Following where God is leading us often leads us to dark and difficult places, challenging things where we have to step out. We have to expose ourselves. We have to take risk. We have to walk in faith. And that's not easy. And there's no getting away that there are times when God calls us to do things. And the easy thing to do is actually just stay on the sidelines or avoid eye contact with the guy walking past you like I did a couple of weeks ago. That's the easy thing to do. Sometimes it comes at a cost for us to walk in faith with God. But you know something? We could skip on a couple of side, slides. The thing that reassures me is that we don't serve a God who's a dictator, who gets his minions to do the things that he doesn't really want to do. He doesn't delegate stuff to us that he doesn't want to do because he can't be bothered to do it. He's a God that demonstrated true and proper sacrifice. He gave the ultimate sacrifice as the ultimate definitive act of love on the cross. For you and for me, who don't deserve it. He took that risk. He paid that price for us. And we are to take that love, that incredible message of hope, and we are to share it with those people around us. God chooses to work through us and in us because he loves us. God doesn't need our help. Can you imagine asking a, a toddler to, to, to do a complex task that you could do quite easily, how frustrating you would find that. That's what it's like with God and his children, but he wants us to grow, he wants us to learn, he wants us to share in the fruits of the harvest. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. An ambassador means an authorised representative. You are an authorised representative of the King of Kings. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. We don't have to do this. We get to do it. 
and we, are, we share God's heart. It's often said, isn't it, if you, if you had a cure for cancer, wouldn't you go and tell people about it? This is even better than a cure for any disease. This is the antidote, antidote to death, as Graham shared this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we may have eternal life with him. And that starts right now. And he calls us to, to come in and participate with him. We're going to show a, a video just sharing a bit more about Compassion's work in a second. But I, I just encourage you, sorry, I just encourage you just to think about where can I start? You know, maybe you're in a place where you've, you've never stepped out in faith. Maybe it's your giving to, to this church, as Graham's, um, as Graham said, you know, maybe, maybe you become a regular giver. Maybe you invest in something else. Maybe today is a day where you could come alongside a child and sponsor them. All I would say is, we live in a culture that says go big or go home. But, but actually, I believe God is calling his people just to start small at times. Start small and keep going. When we look at, watch the news, when we see everything that's going on around the world, it's so easy to feel powerless, isn't it? It's so easy to feel like, what can I do to make a difference? What can I do to make a change? But I really believe that that's a work of the enemy. God wants to equip each and every one of us. He says, you know the plans I have for you. He wants to give us a future and a hope. And he wants us to, to share the fruits of the harvest with him. So I just encourage you just to start small and keep going. Don't be overwhelmed by the size of the task because one child can change a family, one family can change a community and one community can change a city and beyond. And that's what Compassion are seeing all over the world. And here's a great example of that in Larega in the Philippines. Let's watch the video. I grew up in this place. I saw these things happen in my community. At the very young age, I am exposed to drug selling, drug abuse, and drug running. Lorega is a ring in the air. If you say Lorega, then people will always associate you with drug addiction, with prostitution. Child protection is really one of the most important thing that we, uh, partners of Compassion, can do to help the child. I asked them what are the dreams, and most of the mother cried. So I changed the question and I said, okay, if you don't have a dream for yourself, what is your dream for your children? And they cry more. And uh, after talking to more than 200 parents, I can't sleep. I can't sleep because imagining and thinking about, I, I will be ministering to this place where people don't have really a dreams. When I was young, I don't have any hope. But then when I came to know the Lord, it makes something new. He molded me into a beautiful one because of the hope that he gave me. It's really my dream that they can really be released from poverty in all aspects and can be an influencer in their community. I am now a teacher, so now I can teach more students. I can teach more children, mothers, because God teach me. And I want to use my life as a living testimony to those people who don't know Christ yet. Lorega now is totally different. Before, even taxi driver will not come inside Lorega. Shooting every day. But Lorega now is uh, totally open with the gospel. I am here standing in front of you because I am one of those children. My sponsor was from the US. Through her, I am now a graduate student of the Bible School. I always dream with our children because their lives have been giving hope in the community. When other children will see them, it inspires others. Compassion International, the staff, the caseworker, plays a major role to instill into the child that there is hope in spite of poverty. And Larigia now is a, is a better place than before.
I can say that God is my redeemer. God is my cornerstone. And He has done beautiful things in my life. I just love how that portrays not just the transformation in one child, but a whole community. Pastor Dave is saying that he spoke to 200 parents and none of them had any dreams for themselves or their children. That taxi drivers wouldn't even drive into this community because of fear of gunshots. And now it's a completely different place. Transformation is taking place. In Angelica's home, her dad was a was a drug runner for, for the local drug lord. But when he saw the change in her, he stopped what he was doing and he came to faith in Jesus as well. And so many testimonies that we get are not just about the in individual children benefiting, but the whole families and beyond in the communities as well. And that's what we want to do in Cochabamba in Bolivia with children like Killian. Uh, on the stand that you may have seen when you came in outside, we've, we've got a number of children, we've got uh, boys and girls, we've got different ages, different uh, stages in life. It'd be really good if after the service, while you're grabbing a coffee, you just come and have a look and maybe read through inside each profile, you can find some details about the, the child, when their birthday is, a bit about their family situation and the community that they live in. So just encourage you to come and have a look and have a look through. And just maybe see if God is leading you to, to come alongside and sponsor one of those children today. Before I hand back to Graham, it'd be great if we could just spend a few moments in prayer. So I'm just going to be quiet for a second, just allow God to speak to us wherever we're at right now, and then I'll pray. Yeah, Lord, we thank you that you are so good. We thank you that you have s such an incredibly good heart. A heart for justice, but a heart that wants to love on and bless your children. Lord, help us to draw closer and closer to you each day we are here. Help us to become more like you, to renew our minds, to renew our souls, to renew our bodies to be more and more like your son, Jesus. Thank you for the, for the love that you showed, you demonstrated on the cross for us. And Lord, we thank you for all the work that you're doing here through this church, through this ministry, through the lives of individuals. And we thank you for the work that's going on all over the world in eight and a half thousand communities through your ministry in compassion. Lord, change is possible. Transformation is possible. Help us to walk in faith that you can do things above and beyond anything that we can imagine. So, yeah, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to come and share and be together and be with you here this morning. Lord, help us to have that strength of faith to step out, even if it's small things, little moments in each day, to step out and just honour you in what we're doing, to say, God, this doesn't make sense to me, but I feel you're calling me in this direction. Give us the strength to do that. Give us the wisdom to know your voice, to discern that still, small voice that's speaking to us. Help us to focus on you, Lord and become more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.